Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending Transcript sponsored webinar today, a general capture and purification platform for tagless proteins based on a self cleaving split dentin tag. My name is Andrew, product manager for Transcript USA. Just as a reminder, our attendees will be in the listening only mode. If there is a problem or you have a question, please enter it in the chat box. At the end of the webinar, we'll be taking the questions. If we don't get to your questions today due to the time limit, additional questions will be recorded and answered by the follow-up emails. Without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce our speaker today, Dr. David Wood. Dr. Wood is an Associate Professor of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the Ohio State University. He has worked in GMP manufacturing of the Nupogen and Amgen and downstream biologics process development at BMS. He holds two patents on intent-based technologies, one of which forms the core of his current work on disruptive innovations in downstream bioprocessing. Dr. Wood is an expert in protein purification using self-cleaving tag methods, and he's currently working to commercialize the intent technology for applications in research and ultimately commercial uh, manufacturing. Thank you, Dr. David Wood, for joining us today. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you for that great introduction. So uh, it is true that I'm working on self-cleaving affinity tag technologies um, based on intines. And in fact, my very first slide uh, is something that's required by the university to uh, disclaim that I am a founder and co-owner of Protein Capture Science, LLC, which is the company that we've recently started to commercialize the technology that I'm gonna talk about today. So um, as you listen to what I'm saying, keep in mind that I'm trying to make money off of this. Thank you. So what I wanted to do is just give you a quick overview, uh, the motivation of why we're doing what we're doing, a little bit of history that led us to where we are and what we're doing today. And the diagram on the right will make a lot more sense at the end of this, pro uh, at the end of this talk. So, when I worked at Amgen, I was using, I was working in the Nupagen process, and I um, saw how sort of difficult it was to purify uh, different therapeutic protein products. Um, and I became really sort of interested in the protein A platform. So monoclonal antibodies, which represent about 70% of the revenues in the biopharma industry right now, um, virtually all of them are purified using the same uh, basic platform that starts with this uh, protein A affinity um, purification as a first capture step. What comes out of this column is about 95% pure, and then it goes into these polishing steps that are usually much more dependent on the product and the company. But basically, this single platform purifies 70% of the revenues that come out of the biopharmaceutical industry. And the reason that this is possible is because that monoclonal antibodies, I sort of jokingly put these six identical pictures, um, but they all look basically the same. They all have an FC domain down at the bottom, and then they have the antigen binding. And what the protein A affinity uh, column does is it grabs onto that FC domain and basically uses that common feature in all of those um, molecules to purify them using a single platform. And so protein A has now become this incredibly highly developed um, process. And a lot of people complain about how, exper how expensive it is but the, the typical production uh, cost of a MAB is about $30 to $100 per gram. And the protein A resin cost, because it can be reused so much, it represents about $2 per gram of the production cost. And meanwhile, you sell for $2,000 to $8,000 per gram. And so the monoclonal antibody market and protein A, I feel like they're married to each other. And they're going to be married to each other forever because protein A is just so highly developed. But what I wondered while I was working at, at Amgen and in other, uh, in other jobs that I've had in positions as a student is what about all of the other proteins? So these are the proteins on the bottom of this slide and they don't really have a lot of common features. And the question is, can you come up with a single platform that's gonna be able to purify all of these proteins using a single column, even though they don't have much in, in, in common? And so, Today, if you want to purify one of these other proteins, um, what you have is a laboratory scale optimization. And so one protein might require a certain series of columns. Another protein might require a different series of columns. And another protein might 
require still another series of columns where each one of these columns, each one of those steps has to be individually optimized for that protein to give you the kind of purity that you would like. And at manufacturing scale, if you're going to make a billion dollars off of this protein and you need a good process, it makes plenty of sense to invest a lot of time and effort into developing that process. But if you're working in a protein laboratory and you need to purify 100 proteins a week or 100 proteins a month, you don't have time to do this. And so what happens in the discovery groups and the protein science groups is that they instead use a single platforms, but they're based on tags. So what I'm trying to come up with is a platform that'll purify all of these proteins using a single column, but the protein coming out the end is going to be tagless. And so that's sort of where this talk is going. I want this universal affinity capture step it's going to purify all of these proteins, but it's going to give you a tagless purified product at the end. And so for those of you who work in purification, you realize pretty quickly that the only way to do this is by putting some kind of an affinity, uh, affinity group or a, a, an affinity tag and fuse it to your protein. So everybody who's ever purified a protein knows what his tag is. Most of you have used maltose binding protein, maybe GST. Um, flag tag, uh, CMYK tag, all kinds of different epitope tags. And these different tags have been developed for, for various reasons to give higher purity or, or a smaller tag or a bigger tag. Um, but the idea is that if you want a tagless purified product at the end, you have to use a, an endopeptidase, a protease, to remove the tag. And the problem with the endopeptidases is, is that they can be expensive. It requires an additional process. Many of you, if you've ever try to do high throughput with an endopeptidase, you realize that sometimes that protease will chew up your target protein. And then other times for reasons that people hand wave about steric problems or blockage, those proteases just don't work. You had them and the tag doesn't come off. But one of the big problems with these tags is that if you leave the tags on, remember that human therapeutics are usually human proteins. And the idea is that if you're putting a human protein into a human, their immune system won't recognize it. But if you leave this tag on the protein, even something as small as a Hiss tag, there's a real concern from the FDA that the tag will elicit an immune response. And so the idea is that we have tags and that's created this sort of single platform, but the tag removal has always been a problem. And it's a problem because it requires the exogenous addition of a protease that's purified separately. And if you're gonna use it in a GMP process, it has to be produced under GMP conditions. And then it has all of this other baggage associated with it. So what if you could create a system where the tag cleaves itself off very specifically at this one junction, and even better, the tag remains on the column. And that's where we're going with this. So what I wanted to do is give you a little bit of history about how intines came about um, I've been giving talks like this literally since intines were discovered. And so it's been weird to sort of adjust to a world where nobody's ever heard of intines to a world where students have studied them in their, in their textbooks. But what I'm going to do is take a step back, not go too deep into the biology, but just give you the basics. And so what an intine is, is it's short for intervening protein. And intines are found as genetic insertions inside of other host proteins where the host protein is made up of two extines and the intines in the middle. Now, normally you would expect uh, an internal genetic selection to splice at the RNA level to form an mRNA. But in fact, what happens with intines is they go completely through translation without splicing and then splice at the protein level. And these intines were discovered around 1990. The first few papers started coming out 1990 to 1993. And I actually started graduate school in 1993. And I'd worked at Amgen, I had a double major in biology and chemical engineering, and I was really interested in coming up with new ways to purify proteins. And so pretty quickly, the intine splicing mechanism was determined by scientists at New England Biolabs mostly, um, but some other professors were also involved. And it became clear from that mechanism that you could make sort of trivial mutations within the intine, kind of obvious mutations, that could give you intines that instead of splicing would cleave at one terminus or cleave at the other terminus, at the C terminus. And pretty soon it was recognized that the N-terminal cleaving could be induced by thiol addition. You're basically doing a chemical cleavage of a stable thioester, um, whereas the C-terminal cleaving is induced by a pH or temperature change. 
And so I'm, I'm not going to go too deep into it, but the N-terminal cleaving intein that was induced by thiol was eventually commercialized by New England Biolabs, and it was called the IMPACT system. And again, most of you who've done protein purification have at least heard of the IMPACT system, and a lot of you have probably worked with it. Um, the problem with the thiol addition, and I'm not going to talk very much about that, that intein, is that the addition of thiol tends to break disulfide bonds. And so that intein has some issues if you're going to try to purify any protein with disulfide bonds. Whereas if you have pH or temperature change, that's a fairly innocuous um, um, change that most proteins can withstand. And so the big idea uh, was a slide that I created in graduate school. So this slide is literally 25 years old. Um, and I've kept it from, from, from all of my talks. Uh, but basically, the idea is that you're going to have a, your affinity tag, whatever that might be. You're going to have an intein that allows that tag to self-cleave. And then you're going to have your product protein on the end. You'll express that under conditions that suppress cleaving. You'll do the purification, the binding and washing, under conditions that suppress cleaving. And then you'll shift the pH or the temperature, or both. It'll lead to a fairly rapid cleaving reaction. The tag and the intein remain on the column and you end up with a tagless protein eluded directly from the column. And so I'm gonna skip through this real fast, but we started with the mycobacterium tuberculosis intein. We deleted the homing endonuclease domain to make it smaller and decrease the metabolic load. We subjected the whole thing to a genetic selection based on thymidylate synthase. And I've published papers on this again about 20 years ago. And the genetic selection allowed us to recover a, a cleavage mutation. And what that cleavage mutation did in that mini intein is it hugely accelerated the cleavage rate. So what we see is sort of the normal inteins down below, they all have some pH sensitivity, but our delta ICM intein, which has this mutation, accelerates quite a lot at the lower pH. And then we characterized this, we showed that it's also um, temperature and pH sensitive. And that allowed us to identify conditions for expression, binding, and washing where cleavage was suppressed. And we were able to do these really nice purifications. So this purification is acidic fibroblast growth factor. Um, in lanes one and two, the heavy band up at the top is our precursor. It's maltose binding domain with an intein. Three and four is the flow through, showing that it binds to the column completely. And then the cleaved acidic fibroblast growth factor comes out of the bottom of the column. Um, after we've induced the cleaving reaction. And what you see is sort of this exponential decay. What we did in this case is we pushed a, a pH shift slowly through the column and allowed the cleave protein to accumulate as a peak. And because it's a unimolecular exponential decay reaction, the concentration of protein coming out of the column exponentially decays um, over time. And you can actually concentrate it further by simply running the column slower. And then in the last two lanes, you see the uncleaved precursor that didn't quite cleave to completion, but the cleave tag now can be eluded off the column. This was maltose binding tag, so we just put maltose buffer through. Um, here's another example. We purified a subunit of RNA polymerase. And again, now you have the time scale at the bottom that shows that we were able to collect the product peak in less than about two and a half hours once we shifted the pH. And again, a nicely uh, purified protein. And so this is where we were when I left graduate school. And when I started at Princeton about 20 years ago, uh, we started looking at other kinds of tags. So one of the things we did is we put this self-precipitating uh, tag called the lastin-like peptide. And basically it very selectively precipitates at relatively low salt concentrations. And this allows you to basically uh, make this protein, precipitate the ELP in a single test tube, wash the pellet, resuspend it at a low pH, allow the cleavage reaction to take place, and then re-precipitate the ELP. And so here's a purification of chloramphenicol acetyltransferase. Again, the heavy band up at the top is the, the precursor protein. Um, these are the different washes and cleavages. And again, out of a single tube with no chromatography, you can get this really nicely purified um, chloramphenicol acetyltransferase enzyme. And uh, I can't remember what this protein was that we were purifying. But in this case, we did a couple of precipitations and I hugely overloaded the gel to give you an idea of, of how pure our protein can be using this can be, uh, can completely non-covalent method or non-chromatographic method. And so we also used this where we tagged a subunit of RNA polymerase 
and then we allowed the RNA polymerase holoenzyme to assemble, and we were able to purify the entire complex, a non-covalent complex, again, using this simple precipitation method. So beta, beta prime, sigma alpha, if you remember your college biology, all the different subunits of the E. coli RNA polymerase. And we, we were able to publish all of these. And so we also showed that it worked for high throughput applications with the ELP. So again, these are each taken from a different well of a micro titer plate. And it shows how for different product proteins, we got extremely um, consistent uh, purification levels and purities. And then another thing that we did to try to make it even cooler for GMP applications is we worked with a guy named Jesus Sanz in um, Spain who developed a lie tag based on a choline binding protein. And basically it binds to choline, but it turns out choline looks a lot like a quaternary amine on a Q cephalos column. And so we thought, well, you can buy a GMP Q cephalos, um, a GMP grade Q cephalos, and then use this tag. And in this case, the, the product protein that we were purifying was maltose binding protein. We hugely overloaded this gel to give you an idea of how clean it was. So yeah, you do see a little bit of the choline binding domain intian leach tag that's coming off the resin, but otherwise you see very few significant contaminants. So I'm, I would argue that this is at least 97, 98, 99% pure. And again, uh, a very simple purification. The precursor expressed really well in E. coli. You bind it, you wash it, you elude it, and in as little as two or three hours, you're eluding this massive band off of your off of your resin. So that's about where things were at Princeton. And as cool as all of this looks, and as excellent as it all seemed, there was one sort of really critical problem that we had. And this is where I'm getting more into sort of the, the technology that we've developed. Now the first problem that we had, and this became sort of my my real headache whenever I'd present my research anywhere, is the first question I'd always get is, well, you know, what happens in yeast cells? What happens in mammalian cells? Everything you're showing us is in E. coli. And it turns out there's a reason that it was all in E. coli. And the, the reason is this. So I can express proteins in E. coli at a fairly low temperature, 16, 20 degrees. Um, in fact, that's commonly done to increase solubility. But it turns out the intracellular pH of E. coli, depending on who you ask, is around seven and a half. Um, and under that low temperature and that higher pH, the cleavage half-life is about 17 hours. So you can get proteins to, um, to express without cleaving. On the other hand, Cho, you're really limited to something above, I don't know, I've heard people say you can go down to 30 degrees, but you're at a much higher temperature and you're at neutral pH and it gets secreted into the growth media. And of course, Cho expressions go on for days, if not weeks. And under those conditions, the cleaving half-life for the same protein is gonna be about an hour and a half. And as a result, if you try to use our initial intein in Cho, that intein is gonna cleave as soon as the protein is produced by the cell. By the time you get it onto the column, your tag is long gone. So you'll do a great job of purifying your cleave tag, but the target protein will flow right through with the rest of the contaminants. And this was something that was really a problem even 20 years ago. And so what you had about 20 years ago was the Impact CN system that a lot of you have worked with. I can tell you um, New England Biolabs beat us to the patent office and they were able to file a couple of very broad patents on Intine technologies. Uh, we tried to work with them to commercialize the Delta ICM Intine, but we were unable to come to a deal that both sides felt was equitable, and our Intine was therefore blocked from being commercialized or commercially used for about uh, 15 more years. Their patents have expired now, so we have freedom to operate and we're far more excited. But for the last 20-ish years, you've had a, a choice between impact CN, where you would have to add thiol, which would destroy disulfide bonds. There's a lot of guidance from New England Biolabs on how to minimize that effect, so I need to give credit to that. But there are other chemicals you can use. There are lower thiol concentrations. Um, it decreases the cleavage rate. But my argument would be that, that those chemicals are going to be very hard to scale up, and that process is going to be very hard to scale up. So again, it's also largely limited to laboratory applications, and I've been told that there are some proteins that also prematurely cleave. The other system that you had was our Delta ICM, which was not commercially available, unfortunately, um, but it was plagued by premature cleavage, sort of like what I've explained to you now. And so you really had a problem 
And the other problem that I didn't write down here is that both of these systems showed very variable cleavage rates with different proteins. So you would get the glossy brochure, you'd see your awesome protein cleaving really fast, and then you'd put your favorite protein in there and it would either cleave prematurely or it wouldn't cleave at all, or it would cleave halfway and stop for no apparent reason. And what would end up happening is you, a lot of people got frustrated with both of these systems because they couldn't predict how the proteins would behave. And so this leads me to sort of the third part of my talk, and that's sort of the finally ready for prime time system that I'm gonna to try to convince you now actually exists. And that's our current technology, and it's very different from what I've just shown you. So the, the sort of push to our current technology was triggered by DARPA. I was on a DARPA project a few years ago called the Biomod Project, which was short for Biomolecules on Demand. And the idea was to create a briefcase size device that can make any therapeutic protein a single dose ready to inject into a patient in less than 24 hours. And DARPA gave me and my team, the team leader was Govind Rao at uh, UMBC, and he was an incredible leader and I have just an infinite number of really good things to say about him. But we had these different corporate partners. I was the Ohio State part. Um, and I, we were gonna use our intine technology to purify all these proteins. Um, they gave us a whole pile of money and the goal was to replace this biopharmaceutical factory with literally something that you could carry with you in a suitcase or even a laptop. And it would have a few uh, tiny little columns, it would have different buffering, um, it would have different analytics on it, and it would be able to spit out this uh, this, NT, this this purified product protein. Now, the intines that we had at the beginning of the, the DARPA project were basically these intines, and I was, of course, married to my intine that had premature cleaving. And we found that we were using cell-free expression because that was the fastest way to make the protein in our device. But even as with the speed of cell-free expression, we would have problems with premature cleaving and cleaving the way we wanted the protein to cleave. And so I had a student at the time, his name was Chang Hua Shi, and I think he's at Wuxi now. Um, but he became a co-inventor on a lot of what I'm about to show you. And he told me that, you know, there was a lot of research on split intines. And I, being a professor, was very stubborn. But he talked me into uh, looking at split intines. And basically, we started by um, the, the assumption with split intines is that if you have this assembled intine on the left here, you end up with premature cleaving. But if you're able to cut the intine into two segments, and there are some intines that are naturally cut, um, then those this smaller intine segment on your target protein is incapable of cleaving because it hasn't assembled the cleaving complex. And so the idea is that if you can use this effectively as an affinity ligand that you would attach to a column and your tag target would then be added later, you could assemble those on the column and then do your washing under non-cleaving conditions and then rapidly cleave. And this would get rid of the premature cleaving problem. And so this is what we started with. And we started with our, our Delta ICM intine, um, and we put everything we knew, our mutation, we put all of the different uh, pieces that we knew to do, and we looked at the cleaving. So on this slide, uh, you have a fairly large protein that's cleaving. Um, the two bands that you see at hour 16 are basically the uncleaved precursor on top and the cleaved target protein on the bottom. The intine tag is quite small and it runs off the bottom of the gel. But what you see is that at pH 8.5, over 16 hours, you get a little bit more than 50% cleaving, whereas at pH 6.2, you get a little bit less than, say, let's say 20% cleaving. Um, this isn't terribly pH sensitive and nobody's gonna wanna wait 16 hours for a protein to cleave. And so what we did was we did a rational redesign of the split intine based on everything that we knew. And I could talk for another 20 minutes about all of the ideas that we had and all the things that we put into this. But to make a long story short, we neutralized to um, cysteine residues. Um, we converted an aspartic acid to glycine, which was our original Delta ICM mutation. And then we changed the serine to histidine at the end of this intine. And we found, we attempted to find a pH sensitive cleaving reaction. And what we found is that we still didn't. Uh, have pH sensitivity. But then sort of something very interesting happened. We noticed in um, 
we actually attempted to make a zinc binding domain so that we could control the cleaving by zinc addition. And what we found when we were looking at zinc binding domains that we were gonna put on the front end of the intein, we found that different residues immediately preceding the intein. So GFP, now here's your target protein. So we're on the opposite end of the intein, on the n extein. And what we found is that different amino acids that we put in that minus one position would give us this profoundly different rate of cleavage at pH 6.2 and 8.5. So this minus one position had a huge influence, not only on the overall cleavage rate, but also on how pH sensitive the cleavage was going to be. And that led us to develop what we call the sensitivity enhancing domain. And we filed a patent on that recently and it's actually issued now. But the sensitivity enhancing domain was put on the front end of the intine ligand. The intine, the affinity tag was now put on the back end of the intine. And this intine, when we assemble that, actually does have pH sensitive. And so our sensitivity enhancing domain that's in our patent that we've filed is, is GDGHG immediately preceding the intine. We get a really nice cleavage rate, but we actually created a FRET-based system that allows us high throughput screening of these upstream sequences. And we found that we can almost perfectly tune how fast and pH sensitive these intines are based on their N-extine sequences, which was pretty cool and gives us an important lever to pull when we're optimizing different processes. But anyway, so we took the sensitivity enhancing domain and the intine, the same one that I showed you before, which now is has maybe 20 or 30% cleaved at pH 8.5 overnight, but now at pH 6.2, it's almost completely cleaved at five hours. And this is room temperature. The target protein is streptokinase. But you'll understand why I'm, I'm sort of being blank about the proteins, because there's more that I need to tell you about that. But the idea is that if you're going to bind and wash, you'll probably be able to get your binding and washing done within an hour or two, where you see almost no pre-cleaving. And then you shift the pH to 6.2 by just changing buffers. And again, you get almost complete cleaving coming out the bottom of the column. And at overnight, if you're willing to wait that long, and again, this is room temperature, you can get pretty much 100%. So what we did after that is we took off our affinity tag to bind to the resin, and we went ahead and put in a unique cysteine residue that allows us to do a single point covalent attachment through the thiol. Um, in the linker between our ligand and our uh, resin, we went ahead and threw in a his tag so that we can manufacture this ligand pretty easily. Um, and now we have this covalently bound ligand where an end user can come in with their favorite target protein, put this little tag on it, bind it to our resin. The binding coefficient has been reported at nine nanomolar. When we measured it, we got two nanomolar. So it's a very, very strong and specific binding. And then once you've washed out all your contaminants, you have a pH sensitive cleavage reaction. And the beauty of the cleavage reaction is that it seems really neutral toward different salts, different sugars, different other additives that you could put into your buffer. It really seems to only care about the pH. And so then you can recover your target protein. And so the first thing that we did is we said, okay, Let's take a high value target. So this is granulocyte colony stimulating factor. It's the basically filgrastim, the biosimilar of Nupagen. And you see a binding phase where we bind the cell lysate. We, we made it in um, the shuffle express protein, the shuffle expression system from New England Biolabs. So it has a, a disulfide bond and an unpaired cysteine residue. Um, and so we were able to get soluble expression and we ran it through this column, binding, washing, we wash out all of the, of the contaminant proteins at pH 8.5. And then what we did is we did a pH 6.2 buffer wash. And once the buffer had saturated the column, we simply stopped the uh, flow, waited for the cleaving reaction to take place. And then we restart the flow and we elute this protein. And again, this is what a high sensitivity silver stain gel looks like. Um, I Definitely you can see a few impurities that have come along, but I would argue that this is as clean or cleaner than anything you're gonna see on a his tag column. And this is completely tagless GCSF. It, the amino acid sequence is identical to the therapeutic protein. And we went ahead and you know ran it on our SEC, HPLC. You get this beautiful single peak. We can't even detect aggregates um, or any significant contaminants. Um, the formulation blank is this the second peak here. 
Um, and we did an, an activity assay, sorry, I should have resized that font, but the activity assay showed that the GCSF that we made was actually more active than the standard that we bought. And so we were pretty proud of ourselves and we thought this is gonna be awesome. But what I didn't tell you, like any good sales rep who doesn't tell you the bad part, is that the cleaving reaction here took 20 hours. And so that cleaving reaction was required to get you know, 90, 95% yield off of the column. And we felt pretty strongly that most customers are not gonna be willing to wait 20 hours for a cleaving reaction, which got back to sort of that, the monster under the bed from 20 years ago, that different proteins seem to cleave at different rates and nobody knew why. And so this variable unpredictable cleaving rate was the third problem that we really, really had to solve. And when we were playing with this intine, we purified a bunch of different proteins, um, GCSF that I just showed you, but streptokinase, GFP, beta-lac. And what you see is the two cleaving time points in each of these gels is zero hours and five hours. And what you see with streptokinase is it cleaves really almost to completion in five hours under at room temperature, but green fluorescent protein cleaves uh, 50-60% beta-lac 50-60%, and then maltose binding protein cleaves pretty nicely, probably 70-80, you could argue even 90%. And so this different cleavage rate was happening between these proteins. Um, and historically, when people had worked with intines, there was a lot of hand-waving about steric conditions and whether the protein was folding well and what was going on with the intine and whether the protein was pulling on the intine and all these other questions. But you know, DARPA wanted us to get this technology to work for this, this Biomod project. And so we really tried to focus on what exactly was going on. And that led to our, our third real breakthrough. So the first thing that we did is we took GFP, which we knew was, you know, a sort of moderately slow cleaving protein. We put the first three extine residues that normally follow our NPU intine in nature, so we thought it would be comfortable with those, but then we systematically changed the first amino acid to all 20 naturally occurring amino acids. And what we found very quickly was that these different amino acids cleaved at very different rates. Um, and methionine, which is you know the universal start codon, was sort of in the middle. It wasn't super fast and it wasn't super slow, but basically if your target protein started with glycine, um, it would cleave very, very slowly. And what you don't see on this is proline because proline didn't cleave at all. And so what we noticed is that the sort of grouping of how things cleaved kind of followed a little bit of the logic of these sort of Venn diagrams of different, of different amino acids. But then we went back and we did what, what in my mind was the sort of the, the real breakthrough. Um, and that was we took proteins that we knew cleaved slow like GCSF and we took the first five amino acids of GCSF and we put it on the front end of green fluorescent protein. And what we found was that as soon as we did that, the green fluorescent protein immediately behaved exactly the same as GCSF. Conversely, if we took the first few amino, <coughs> first few amino acids of streptokinase and put those on the front end of GFP, then the GFP would immediately behave the same as streptokinase. And so the profound uh, conclusion here, based on admittedly sparse data, was that the first few amino acids on the front end of the target protein really dictate to a huge extent how it's gonna behave in terms of cleaving. And the important implication of that is that if you know how every set of three or four amino acids is gonna cleave, then you know how every protein is gonna cleave by just looking at their first three or four amino acids. And so admittedly, we didn't make 400 clones or 4,000 or 40,000 or however much it would take to do that. We did a limited factorial experiment where we took a different amino acid from different families of amino acids. And we put one in the plus one position, we put another one in the plus two position, and we did this sort of combinatorial plus one plus two factorial experiment. And what we found pretty quickly was if you look in the upper left, if you start with aromatic residues, your protein's always gonna behave pretty well. It's gonna cleave at least 70 or 80% within five hours, even if you have a proline in the second position. 
On the other hand, if you have a proline in the first position, as you see in the upper right, nothing's going to cleave. The entine's dead. But as with the majority of our proteins in the lower left over here, if you start with methionine, suddenly the second amino acid has this profound impact on how fast the protein is going to cleave. And the same is true for most of the amino acids. So what we found was that the, the overall, I'm going to skip back a couple, the overall cleavage rate of the single amino acid is retained even if it's in the second position. So you can sort of do almost an averaging of how fast the first amino acid cleaves and how fast the second amino acid cleaves. And you'll actually have a pretty good idea of how fast your target protein is going to cleave. And so one of the things we did to test that hypothesis is we went back to GCSF, where as I told you, the native GCSF cleaves over about 20 hours. But if we take the first methionine of that GCSF and convert it to phenylalanine, now that we know that aromatics are good, suddenly we can rescue that protein and get it to 90% cleaving in five hours and greatly decrease the cleaving half-life which means that now we can rationally go in and engineer the end terminus of a given target protein before we make a clone, before we do anything, and basically predetermine how it's gonna behave and rescue it if it looks like it's gonna behave badly. And so for those of you who work with therapeutics, you may make the argument, well, wait a minute, but if you modify the end terminus of the target protein, uh, it's no longer a native human protein, so you can't do that. My argument is actually, yes, you can. So streptokinase was a therapeutic protein. The native protein starts with this uh, IAGPE, but the drug, when it was being used, maybe to make it easier to express or for whatever reason, they changed all five of the first amino acids. Even GCSF, the native human protein, starts with alanine, but the, the therapeutic that you get from Amgen starts with methionine, again, so that they could express it in E. coli. Um, EPO, on the other hand, has not been modified, but TPA, Redaplace, also modified it at its end terminus, and interferon alpha 2b also modified it at its end terminus from the from the native protein. And so this idea of modifying the very first or one or two amino acids of therapeutic peptides to make them easier to manufacture is something that we've been doing in the in the manufacturing industry in the biopharmaceutical industry for quite a while. So if you can come into this process um, and be able to, to uh, purify your proteins reliably, I think that's something that most people would be willing to do, especially if it's a fairly innocuous change. And so where we really see the, the power of this technology, and I'm getting close to the end now, I'm gonna show you a few more examples of purifications. But the idea is that if you're in an early development group or a discovery group in a large company, you really don't have any choice but to use tags. And most of these groups will use a HIST tag. And then they'll do their initial characterization. They'll might maybe do small animal studies, initial tox studies, um, using a tagged protein. Because removing the tag when you're doing sort of high throughput and looking at tens or even hundreds of candidates isn't really practical. And coming up with a tagless purification for all of them is completely unrealistic. But at some point, if you're gonna go into the clinic and you're gonna put this into a human, you're pretty much required to remove that tag and come up with a completely new process to purify that protein. So now not only do you have to come up with a new purification process, but you also have to have faith in the fact that all those studies that you did with the HIST tag or whatever tag in place are still going to accurately describe the molecule that you're now going to go into clinicals with. And as one of our partners and, and customers said that companies are sort of whistling in the dark when they're sort of hoping that the tagless, the tagged protein and the tagless protein are gonna behave similar during their development, um, development train. And this technology, by allowing you to start with a tagless protein with the same ease that you would use a HIST tag purification, maybe even a higher purity, but now you can start with a tagless protein from your very first characterization experiment and use the same capture and cleavage column at manufacturing scales later. And so this is where we see the real impact of this technology. So for a lot of you doing research, you can now breathe a sigh of relief that you can have a product in hand with no tag on it. And for those of you developing therapeutics, you can now go into the clinic with the, with the actual protein that you started out with. And so we have uh, several patents now. Um, I think there was a mention of two patents, but I think we're up to five or six 
and, and still others that are pending. And we now have sort of this glossy brochure, if you recall, this is from my very first slide, where we have a capture resin that has this, this affinity uh, ligand on it, the half intine. You have your target protein because this is, it's a 35 amino acid tag. So it's not small, but it's not too large, but it's completely inert. It can't cleave until it assembles with the other half of the intine on the capture resin. So whether you wanna put this in mammalian cells, insect cells, cell-free expression, bacteria, you name it, the, the hope is that, that it's going to secrete well and express well. And we haven't had any problems with it decreasing solubility or any of the usual headaches. Any of you who have a significant experience in protein purification know that you never say never, right? There's always gonna be the one protein that's not gonna work. But so far it's behaved really beautifully and I'll show you some data. And then um, you would cleave your target protein tagless. Maybe it might have an amino acid or two difference on the front end, but other than that, it's gonna be completely traceless as if there was never a tag on it. And then in step five, it turns out you can regenerate the capture resin uh, with a low concentration of phosphoric acid. So a very simple and easy um, method for stripping off the tag once you're finished. And the, we've been told by some people who are, who are doing this testing now that this uh, resin is also pretty good against caustic if that's what you're into for sanitizing. So I just wanted to show you a few more examples of what we did. Um, in this case, superfolder GFP, we expressed in E. coli. Again, whole cell lysate, clarified cell lysate. Um, it's completely soluble. Uh, the flow through um, and the wash, and then we changed the pH. And again, the elution comes out, a little bit of impurity here, a little bit of impurity, maybe some proteolytic degradation, but by and large, you get a very, very clean product, again, off of this single column. And I believe this is five hours cleaving at room temperature. Um, there's a lot of numbers in here about the, the total recovery and the binding capacity of the column. What we're able to get out of the column is about 15 to 20 mg per mil of GFP. And again, the molar amount is what matters. So bigger proteins, we expect to get higher amounts, smaller proteins, lower amounts. But the binding capacity, it's not what you would see with an ion exchange or maybe even a histag, but it's for a mole for mole basis, it's much higher than you would see on say a protein A column. And so here's our little uh, high trap column. It was the very first column we ever packed, um, the E001. And um, this is the, the green fluorescent protein that we alluded off of this column. So this was a very exciting slide for us when we first created it, because it was our first time with the pack column. Again, another product, streptokinase made in E. coli. It looks like, here's a silver stain gel at the bottom. Um, a little bit of premature, or not premature cleaving, but proteolytic degradation, and maybe a little bit of, of uncleaved tag leaching off, but also by and large, a pretty clean product. One thing that I do wanna mention, since I'm looking at this, this gel, is we have used protease inhibitors to decrease the, the, any proteolytic degradation. The cool thing is that because the intine's mechanism is completely different from any other protease, you can use whatever protease inhibitor you want. The intine still cleaves as if there was no protease there. And so it's completely compatible with protease inhibitors. And again, GCSF purification, another attempt in E. coli. Um, and this was a protein cholesterol oxidase. Again, it cleaves super slow. Um, overnight, only about 50% cleaving. We put a phenylalanine on the front end of it and overnight it had cleaved almost to completion at that point. We think that we could put maybe two amino acid change on this and we'd be able to get complete cleaving in about three hours. Um, but then, you know, one of the questions is, well, is the tag gonna interfere with secretion? And so for the Western blot, we did a whole bunch of different uh, secretion leader sequences. We did a bunch of statistics on them. And here's interferon alpha 2b being made in um, XP293. Um, you get a nice um, band in the cell culture supernatant. It expresses really well, and we're able to purify it really nicely. A few of these uh, contaminants, this was done on a gravity column. If you look at our later results, this is a, an SCFE also made in XB293. Um, this again is the cell culture supernatant where you get a nicely secreted product protein. And now in the cleaved material, I would challenge you to find any significant impurities. And again, this is a, this is a silver stain gel. So the, the mammalian expression, if anything, is spectacularly uh, well-behaved and pure. And again, here's our, our HPLC.
Um, and here's mature interferon, uh, a little bit of proteolytic degradation, but we think we can engineer around that. What's funny about this one is we actually changed it back to the true human and terminus. So this is actually more human than the therapeutic protein. And so this is the true bona fide human protein that's now being produced. And again, I would challenge you to find any significant impurities. And then finally, we made GCSF in mammalian cells just to sort of show that we could, and we get a nice purification on that as well. So I'm just wrapping up. Um, I'm going a little longer than I intended to, but uh, I believe that we do actually have this new platform for everything else. A resin that you purchase, you pack into a column or you can buy pre-packed columns from us. Um, and you take a lysate from whatever your favorite or a supernatant from whatever your favorite expression host is. You put this tag on it, you pay attention to the front end of your target protein to make sure that you get nice robust cleaving. But what comes out of that first column at pretty high purity is basically whatever protein you want. As long as you can express it soluble or make it soluble by refolding and bind it to this column, you're gonna get a tagless traceless protein. And so that's our glossy brochure. You're gonna see a lot more of it, I hope, in the coming months. And again, the summary, this idea that you can go from discovery to manufacturing on a single platform, I think is really where the impact of this technology lies. And again, it works great for high throughput applications, especially since the cleavage is now predictable. And um, we're looking at biosimilars and new drug development, and also as a CMO CRO platform for you companies out there that like to make proteins for other people. And so finally, because I had the disclaimer at the beginning, our company is proteincapturescience.com. We're looking for new partners, new beta testers, and our first production run of resin is probably gonna be in the next couple of months. And we're gonna look at sending pre-packed columns as well as bulk resin. Please sign up on our webpage. The webpage is still new. So when you go in, it's not as polished as you might expect. Um, we're gonna be working on it as much as we can, but there is a spot to get put on our mailing list and we will have free samples available to groups who want to try this out as beta testers. And we're looking to have very close relationships with those groups. And again, the students who worked on this, uh, basically all of these students have data that's in my talk. Um, I've had a lot of undergrads come through my lab. Um, in the interest of time, I won't tell you where they all are now, but all of these companies have gone on to major biopharma companies, except for the ones who are still in the lab. And again, Chenghua Shi, who goes as Stephen, was a co-inventor, and Joe Terrace, Jacqueline Miozzi, and Brian Marshall are all, except it's Jacqueline Galliardi, I forgot she got married. Um, they're all current final year PhD students who are gonna be looking for positions, and they're all absolutely outstanding. And we had a lot of help from different funding agencies and industry partners. So that brings me to the end of my talk, and I am very excited to hear your questions and help to um, get you more familiar with my technology. Thank you very much.